Creepshow from 1982 is one of the most beloved horror anthologies of all time, so let's take a look at all five segments and rank them from worst to best. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you're having a good one today. I'm the Movie Ranker, and today I'm going to take a look at the classic movie Creepshow from 1982. It's a horror anthology. It's very beloved in the horror community. One of the best there is out there. It has consistency with its tone and its quality. Um, it's based off of comic books from back in the 1950s. Directed by the great George Romero. And screenplay was written by Stephen King himself. Got a lot of big names attached to it. It's a whole lot of fun from start to finish. There's no bad segments in here. And before I get into my ranking, I just want to talk about the whole wraparound story. We don't get much to it, so I'm not going to rank it. But I do like how this movie starts off with a father played by Tom Atkins himself. And he's this angry, like, very angry, hard-ass father who hates that his son is wasting his time with these comic books. He throws it out into the garbage. And we do get this really cool silhouette, or like this corpse come up to the kid's window uh, great practical effects there looks really creepy and they really incorporate the comic book style here uh, especially going through each segment we kind of go through a comic book looks really cool and the way the movie wraps up we go back to this wraparound story where uh, the garbage men one of them played by tom savini finds the, the comic book and notices a coupon of a voodoo doll missing which we find out that the kid had ordered previously and he is using it on his father at the end. And his father's having like throat pains, neck pains, and it kind of ends there. We don't know what really happens. It's a very short little intro and outro to this film, but it works really well. It doesn't necessarily tie in the stories or nothing. It kind of just uses the stories as parts of this comic book. And without wasting any more time, let's get into the ranking of these five short stories. So for me in last place, at number five, I have... They're creeping up on you. I always found this one to be the weakest out of all five stories, even though it's not bad in any way. Um, I'm just not that creeped out by bugs and that. Yes, it's disgusting. Uh, if you see a place with cockroaches and that, it, it just makes it feel dirty. But I'm not necessarily scared of that. So that's maybe why I have this one in last place in my ranking. But it's still good nonetheless. We follow this businessman who's a germaphobe. He, he hates germs, he hates bugs, he's a very clean person. He kind of treats people like cockroaches, you know, just tries to get rid of them and he doesn't want to be bothered with other people that he sees as a lower class. I feel like there's a lot of symbolism there with the way the cockroaches are coming at him and the way he treats other business people and stuff like that and their families. And as the story plays out, we get more and more bugs, cockroaches crawling through his vents and everything. Uh, we get great cinematography here. You get like lightning outside and that kind of shines in and shows the bugs. And yeah, the bugs are real. Like, these are real bugs running around. So it does look creepy. Um, and the way it ends where he locks himself in the room from, to get away from them. But he actually locks himself in with a ton. And it ends with them like pouring out of his corpse and all that. Great, great effects. You can tell that it's a dummy, but it still looks really cool. All these bugs coming out of his, out of his corpse. And it makes you think, was this all in his head? Is he Was he just going crazy because he's a germaphobe? Or did this really happen? Uh, it kind of leaves you questioning that. But I always found that this one was good, but not good enough to end your anthology. It kind of ends on a sizzle. It sizzles out instead of being this big bang, you know? I think... They could have moved around these stories a bit more. But still, even though it's in last place, I still enjoy watching it. Up next, at number four, I got The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill. Uh, this is one played by Stephen King. Uh, it's mostly just him. He has, like, uh, visions or, like, uh, dreams, aspirations of, like, seeing, like, doctors and university professor or whatever. But the story really just focuses on him finding this meteorite. And the first thing that comes in his mind is, I can make money off this, pay off my debts, and all that. So, uh, his greed ends up, and is in impatience, because he wants the meteor right away. He pours water on it to cool it down, which was a bad idea. Because this is not just a meteor, right? It's a, a biological creature, or whatever, that uh, looks like nature, like grass, and weeds growing out everywhere. 
And this causes him to be infected when he touches it and burns his fingers. It starts to grow out of his fingers and it grows all over his land, all through his house until the very end. He's completely covered from head to toe and he takes his own life with a shotgun. And that ending is like, whoa, you don't kind of see it coming because this is a bit more of a goofier uh, type of story the way uh, Stephen King plays it he plays it very like campy a little bit corny but it's it's really fun to watch and yeah his basically his greed of wanting to make money off this uh is his doom and also he has a chance to go to see a doctor or go to the university but he's scared that since he's infected that they will amputate so his fear of getting worse actually made him worse because he wouldn't go get help that mixed with his greed really caused his demise and he ends up taking his own life at the end. Like I said, very dark ending for a kind of goofy segment, but I always enjoyed this one. It doesn't go very deep or anything, but it's just kind of one of the funner segments in here, even though, like I said, it has a really dark ending, but it's still fun nonetheless. Up next, at number three, I got Father's Day. Now, I know this is one of the fan favorites in this movie. It's pretty damn good. Um... It kind of, the first half's a little bit convoluted, I might add. Um, you're not really sure what's going on. It's just mostly conversations happening with these this rich family. And we learn to find out that the, the father, the grandfather of the family had all this money, all this inheritance. And he was mean to his family and that. So his daughter ends up killing him. Not just because of, out of that, because she got pushed to this point after she suspects that her father killed her husband or her boyfriend in a hunting accident. And it just drives her crazy to the point where she's making him a Father's Day cake. And he just keeps yelling, where's my cake? And that it drives her mad. She ends up killing him. Um, funny thing enough, most people don't have a Father's Day cake. That's kind of weird. But besides the point, um, the whole family ends up getting rich off of this because they inherit all of his money right and they kind of suspect that the aunt murdered him they kind of know but no one says anything because they're scared of losing their riches their greed kind of gets to them uh kind of a running theme in here and what eventually happens is the father comes out of the grave uh gets revenge on his daughter and then eventually on the rest of the family and he's like this walking corpse kind of zombie thing and it looks really cool. And it ends with him killing one of his other daughters and using her head as the cake with the candles on top. And you got this great shot of him like holding the head and Father's Day and him throughout the film you know, saying, where's my cake and stuff like that. It's great. Uh, like I said, the first is a bit slow. And then once things pick up, it almost becomes like a slasher movie because this corpse is picking them off one by one. Uh we don't get real crazy deaths or anything like that. There's one that always bothers me is this guy laying, laying in his grave site for so long while this tomb is this like tombstone or headstone is barely moving towards him. And instead of getting up right away, he's kind of in shock and he sees the dead body beside him and he still continues to lay there and he gets killed by that. I found that was always stupid. But besides that, it's still a fun watch, very stylistic. Um, You'll see throughout all these stories when crazy shit happens or shocking things, the screen goes right red with colors and he uses this comic book style really well. And in this one at nighttime, I think they use the blue lighting really well, almost like a Dean Cundy lighting here at night, which, you know, is a great way to, to show you darkness, but you can still see what's going on. In the end, it's a really fun one. It's what kicks off this anthology. Uh, it has... Really cool style to it. Really interesting story. Just the first half can be a little draggy and a little convoluted in the way they explain on what's going on. Up next, at number two, I have Something to Tide You Over. Now, funny enough, this one was always near the bottom of my ranking before. Um, but over the years, it has really grown on me more and more. And I actually really enjoyed it this time around. Uh, Leslie Nielsen is magnificent in here. The best out of all these segments. He's the standout actor here. He he usually plays the silly comedy roles. But in this one he's serious. It's kind of demented and psychotic in the way he plays out. He's very like charismatic in the way he talks and that. But he's so evil. And he ends up kidnapping uh, this girl. Putting her on the beach somewhere. And then taking her, her boyfriend and making 
him, uh, him follow and do what he says because he knows he has his girlfriend, right? And he's a burying both of them in the sand until the tide comes up and takes them out, making the boyfriend watch the girlfriend on a TV. Very messed up. And yeah, there's no way out, no escape. And I just feel like the whole first half of this is this dripping with tension and mystery. You're trying to figure out what's going on. It really gets me invested. And Leslie Nielsen's character really adds to that. Just the way he acts. He's like, the way he trances around in that. It's just so friggin' out there and so like weird and demented for a person to act like this for, and with what they're doing as well. And you get a great revenge at the end of this where he's back at his house and you see as tapes, it must be of other people that he done this to as well. And he um, goes back for the bodies. They're not there. So he just suspects the tie took them out. But no, these are walking, talking corpses like deadites, almost zombies. But they remind me of the fog because they're full of seaweed and that just the looks of them reminds me of the ghost from the fog. And they come back to his place to kill him, to get him back for revenge. And yeah, it's just very atmospheric. You got great fog coming in with the zombie-like deadites here. The sea, sea zombies, I'll call them. And yeah, they're they're kind of like ghosts too because they appear in wherever they want. Like tele, uh, teleport kind of, you know, uh, going through doors and stuff. And they end up getting him at the end and putting him on the beach. And he claims, I can hold my breath for a long time, but we all know that he will not last out there. And yeah, it's just a great revenge flick, a uh, little segment where these people get back at him the same way he did to them. Just great performances, uh, great effects, and just a really interesting, unique story. But for me, easily coming in the first place, I have to give it to The Crate. This has always been my favorite segment of this anthology. It's so friggin' good. Um, we get like a little creature feature in here with lots of blood. It, it, it got great effects. It's about finding this crate in this hall or type of university type place. And it's hidden under the stairs. It's from way back in the 1800s. And there's a creature in there. Almost like a Yeti type creature. And yeah, this Professor Stanley. Uh, him and another guy end up opening it up. It kills some people, makes a big mess, and Stanley freaks out, goes to see his friend Henry. Now, we're introduced to Henry a little earlier. Him and his bitch-ass wife, <laughs> played by uh, Adrian Barbeau, she plays this bitch perfectly. I'm telling you, you love to hate her because she plays it so well. She's obnoxious. She's always putting down Henry and saying that if it wasn't for her, he, he wouldn't even be living because he... She does everything for him and she's the best, basically. Like, she's so friggin' arrogant. And yeah, um, uh, he has these evil thoughts of seeing her die all the time in his mind, and him killing her and stuff. And like, that's what gives him uh, a sense of joy when he thinks of stuff like this. That's how much he hates her. Anyway, these two stories collide because they meet up and he tells them about the crate and about the monster and all the things that happen in the hall. Interesting enough, though, Henry. The first thing he thinks of is this is a great way to get rid of my wife. And so he sedates his friends to leave him at his house. Sets up this crazy plan to get his girlfriend or wife, whatever she is, Wilma, back to the university, the hall. And to have her killed off by this Yeti creature. Pretty cool, pretty genius, a little dark. But, you know, he feels that this is the only way to get rid of her at this point. And yeah. It works, the plan, too. <laughs> and, yeah, the effects in this are just awesome. I love to look at the creature to, like, when he grabs people and slices them with his claws. Great special effects, uh, practical effects, rather. And it's all done by Tom Savini. You know, he's the goat at doing this. Uh, famous for, like, Friday the 13th and Dawn of the Dead, stuff like that. He's the man for the job. And, yeah, this has always been my favorite uh, story in here i like a good creature feature uh, i like when it goes gory and this one does it it's the goriest of all these stories um and the way it wraps up while well, he shoots him in this like this lake or at the bottom of this quarry so you never really know is he going to get back out again and yeah this just begs to have a full feature length film made out of this segment it's just there's just so much there it was the most layered story out of all these stories uh, this and To Tide You Over had like the most layers to them. And you could really make full length films out of both of these if you fleshed them out a little bit more. But yeah, got great characters. Uh, I like how 
uh, Henry gets revenge on his wife for being such a bitch. And by the end, him and his friend could just be friends again because she was really interfering with this man's friendship between Henry and Stanley. Uh, they were down to only having chess uh, games once a week. And even that, uh, Stanley didn't really want to hang around with Henry because of his uh, obnoxious wife. But with her other picture, he's like, now we can play twice a week. And it's just like, it's kind of a happy ending, as weird and dark as it is. But I just love it for that. And yeah, this one just easily comes in the first place for me. I always have a blast with it. And I do want a full feature length film for this segment. So there you have it, guys. There's my ranking of all five stories, segments from Creepshow 1982. I hope you enjoyed it. It's just a really fun, stylistic film. Um, the use of color, like red one is intense moments. I didn't mention that in the crate, but you have a lot of moments like that. It really makes things that stick out on the screen, you know. It's very stylistic. It's very cool. Um, they're all great stories in their own way. They each give you, like, a different flavor of horror, a different subgenre. And there's a reason why this is a, a classic, you know, a staple for all horror fans. Everybody has to watch this movie at least once. It's a landmark in cinema. It's because of the cast and the great people behind the cameras. And I just thoroughly enjoy Creepshow. Let me know how you rank all five segments down in the comment section below. Love to hear it. This is one of those anthologies where I've seen this, the rankings go every way. Like all these movies have potential to be number one in someone's eyes. Depending what type of flavor of horror they want. You know, because they have all different... Uh, styles to them all different subgenres, basically these stories uh you can also follow me on instagram letterbox both of those are in the description of this video hope you enjoy and subscribe to the channel if you like rankings like this and until next time guys thanks for watching